Let's look at section 4.1, which introduces mathematical proofs, specifically direct proofs. Um, this first section is called Direct Proof and Counterexample 1. Um, we're going to begin by talking about counterexamples, which is something that's already been discussed a little bit uh, previous to this chapter. Um, but if you have a universal statement, a counterexample is simply an example of an element in the set that makes the statement false. Okay, so if you're trying to disprove a universal statement, you want to find something in the set that shows that it's not universally true, that statement. Um, specifically, if you have a universal conditional statement like this, what that means is you want a, an element A in D such that P of A is true, but Q of A is false. Okay, so let's look at a specific example. Um, if you take the universal statement for all x in the set of real numbers, if x squared is greater than 0, then x cubed is greater than 0, well, that's not true. And to show that it's not true, we need to find any real number whose square is positive, but whose cube is not positive. So there are lots of possibilities that we could use. One counterexample is x equals negative 1, because the square of negative 1 is positive, the cube of negative 1 is not positive. Now let's talk about the method of direct proof. Um, so uh, the method of direct proof is something that we're going to use if we want to prove a universal statement. So we want to begin by, if necessary, kind of rewriting that given statement. Uh, perhaps we actually rewrite it before, you know, on paper, or sometimes it's enough to just, you know, mentally kind of rearrange things to think of it in terms of if then. Um, the, the whole point of this step is to make sure we understand how to begin the proof. Okay, which brings us to number two. We want to begin the proof by assuming that x is a particular but arbitrarily chosen element of d such that p of x is true. Okay, let me just address this, this phrase particular but arbitrarily chosen. All that's saying is that we're going to choose our x. Um, we're, it's going to remain the same x throughout the proof. Right, so if you see x at the beginning of the proof, it means the same thing as if you see x, you know, two thirds of the way through the proof or in the last step or wherever. The arbitrarily chosen aspect of it simply means that we're not going to assign any other conditions to x out of convenience um, besides the fact that p of x is true. Okay. And I want to stress that we're not looking at an example when we do this. We're going to leave x as a variable x. Um, so we want to make sure the argument um, that we use in the proof applies for regardless of what x is, provided that p of x is true. Okay, And so our objective as we work our way through the proof is to show that q of x must be true because then that would show that whenever p of x is true, q of x is also true. Okay, That would mean that our universal statement is in fact true. Now what we're allowed to use when we go through the process of writing the proof is we can use a set of assumptions that are on page 110, and I'm going to discuss those shortly. Uh, we can use definitions of the terms involved and you're going to see as we go through chapter four, in each section, we're going to get a new set of definitions to work with. We can also use the rules of logical inference that we saw um, back in chapter two that tell us when, you know, an argument is valid or not. Um, in some examples, we are allowed to use previously established results 
You'll also notice that sometimes in, in proofs that are given in the textbook of particular theorems along the way. Um, as far as homework exercises go, unless the instructions say that it's okay to do that, then, um, then we don't want to use previously established results. In other words, we don't want to say, well, in, in problem four, I proved that whatever. Um, we want to, generally speaking, take each proof as if, as if we're kind of starting from scratch, but um, again, allowed to use those assumptions, definitions, rules of inference. Okay, let's talk about these assumptions I referred to. So we need to be able to start from somewhere, right? We, we are not going to sort of reinvent everything from the ground up, um, although sometimes it might feel like that when, in some of the statements that we're asked to prove. Um, we can assume rules of algebra, okay? So we don't have to go back and, and uh, justify um, rules of algebra. Um, those are summarized in Appendix A. We can also use these properties of equality. Um, now, equality is something that comes up when we're talking about numbers, it comes up when we talk about sets, it comes up when we talk about functions, and that's why this is for objects A, B, and C. And these three properties of equality are that A equals A, Okay, so the, you know, the object A equals itself. Um, if A equals B, then B equals A. And if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Okay, these are sometimes referred to as reflexive, symmetric, and transitive properties of equality. Okay, so that's something that we can just accept as known and we can freely use that in any of the proofs that we write. Uh, we may assume that there are no integers between 0 and 1, and that the set of integers is closed under addition, subtraction, and multiplication, um, but not division. Um, let me briefly talk about what that means to be closed under addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Um, all that means is if you add two integers together, the sum is also an integer. If you subtract two integers, that difference is an integer. If you multiply two integers, that product is an integer. Um, that same thing does not hold for division. Um, if you take two divided by three, that's not an integer. Um, so the set of integers is not closed under division. <clears throat> um, and this, this uh, fact that the integers are closed under addition, subtraction, multiplication, you're gonna see this, we need to use that right away for some of the proofs um, in this section. Um, in fact, the example, um, the video where I go through some examples from 4.1, you'll see that come up. Okay, let's talk about the definitions that are given in this section. As I said, each section, each section in Chapter 4 will be introducing some definitions, and this gives us uh, a topic that we can write proofs related to. Okay, we definitions are very important when writing proofs, and you know, um, and we're going to see as we go from one section to another, we'll get these new sets of definitions to to work with. <clears throat> so, in this section, uh, we get definitions for even and odd integers. Uh, an integer is even if and only if it's equal to twice some integer. An integer is odd if and only if it equals twice some integer plus one. And you see that in those two bullet points, those, those definitions are just restated using variables. Um, now, a, f a few minutes ago I said sometimes it's going to feel like we are asked to write proofs about things that are very basic. Um, for example, we might have to write a proof that the sum of two odd integers is even. Um, and so even though, you know, we, we sort of accept that as, as, you know, common knowledge, um, 
what we're getting practice with in this section is learning to use the definitions to prove things like that and sometimes very simple statements um, and uh, and and that's going to be important just to understand how writing proofs works and and how you use definitions and how you structure a proof okay we've got some other definitions given in section 4.1 and these definitions are for prime and composite integers okay um, and You've probably, in, in other courses, seen definitions for prime integers. Composite may or may not be familiar to you, um, but essentially what it means to be a prime integer is that you've got an integer greater than 1 that you can factor as a product of two integers. Um, if it's prime, the only way to do that is the number itself times 1. Okay, And so that's stated here by saying that, you know, um, for all positive integers, r and s, if n equals r times s, then either r or s equals n. Um, don't overlook the restriction that n is greater than 1. Sometimes people forget about that part, but it's an important part of that definition. Um, composite also requires that n is greater than 1. And composite says that we can factor it down in a way so that n equals r times s and r and s are both between 1 and n. So that's what that's indicating is they're both positive and neither of them is 1 and neither of them is n. So therefore, we don't have a prime number. Okay, and, and we've got a couple of ways of restating that. Um, so again, in this section, you'll see uh, exercises that ask you to prove or disprove things um, based around even, odd, prime, composite. Okay, and the example video uh, from 4.1 um, includes um, two examples. One, um, you know, that deals with even and odd, and one that deals with prime and composite. Let's quickly talk about some common mistakes, and this is uh, expanded on in the textbook. But there's a lot of mistakes that come up fairly frequently with people that are learning to write proofs. Um, and I'll just go through some of them. Arguing from examples. So a common mistake is to, rather than write a general argument is to just say hey look at this example that and this works okay but that's not enough to prove a universal statement uh, using the same variable to represent more than one thing okay so if you have an even integer and an odd integer as part of your proof you don't want to call both of them n okay that would be confusing to the whoever is reading it and there'd be no way to keep track of, you know, which n you're talking about. So you've got plenty of letters that you can use for variables. Um, just pick a different one for each quantity that you're referring to, each number or, you know, whatever the proof's about, each object. <clears throat> uh, jumping to a conclusion. So we want to make sure with proofs that we're justifying our steps and we don't want to skip steps or or just, you know, kind of jump to the end. Um, and finally, assuming what is to be proved is also a fairly common mistake um, that we want to avoid. Um, that's it for this video. I uh, hope you found that helpful. Next video, next section is also called Direct Proof and Counterexample, but this is Direct Proof and Counterexample 2, and we'll get some new definitions, and um, I'll see you in the next video.